All right, so hello everyone and welcome to this month's Social 60 panel. So this is where we invite industry professionals to give small businesses knowledge into business and social media best practices. My name is Christina and I'm the Inbound Marketing Specialist here at Hootsuite and I'm very excited to be hosting today's panel because we are going to talk about how to incorporate events and social media into your business strategy. Today I'm here with three amazing panelists. Um, I have Emma Andrews. So Emma Andrews is a registered holistic nutritionist, national educator at Vega, and co-host at Eat to Run Sports Nutrition Workshops here in Vancouver. Emma has developed and facilitated events with the fitness and natural health industry for both national chains and local independent customers. She specializes in integrating an experiential approach to education and community outreach. We also have here Melissa. Um, Melissa joined FreshBooks to host great events and provide extraordinary service on their social handles. With over five years experience building partnerships with community stakeholders, her mandate is to, to increase community engagement with brands through strategic communication. She has also ran events for Canadian Small Business Week and Lululemon Storewide events. And all the way from UK here, we have Mark Walker, who is a blogger, speaker, and the UK content marketing and social media manager for Eventbrite. He prides himself on always delivering both business results and genuine value to his audience, and on learning something new every day. You can get his 14-point checklist for consistency, creating brilliant content at his blog, We Live Content, and connect with him um, on his Twitter handles um, at JFDIMark. <laughs> Uh, now, before we get started on the list of questions I have here for our panelists, be sure to tweet along using our hashtag social60. We'll be compiling all the questions via the hashtag as well as the Google Plus event page during our Q&A at the very end, depending on if we have time or not. But if we do run out of time, our lovely panelists here have said yes to taking the time responding to your questions after the panel. All right, so let's get in here and get started with the first question here. Um, so first question, how can small businesses benefit from integrating events into their business strategy? Emma, why don't you start us off here? Cool. Oh, my uh, favorite tip about this is that it showcases your personality. So it's a way to really humanize your brand and showcase your character. So it's a chance to give a face to who you are, especially because you're hopefully going to have a much larger, cap larger catch mention audience attending your event. Um, so it's a good chance to show that lifestyle leadership, community leadership, and really showcase who you are as a brand. Can you give an example of how Vega has really put a face to their brand through the events? Totally. So at Vega, we're a consumer packaged good company, so we sell to other retailers. So for us, putting on events is a chance for us to show our personality at another retail location. So for an example, we work with a couple of different personal training studios. One of them is called Innovative Fitness. Um, that's here in Vancouver. So we'll go into Innovative Fitness. We'll do an event partnered with them. But it's our chance to showcase who we are as a brand that we're really educational and take people through the nutrition approach that pairs with the personal training, where that built-in audience that's already going to Innovative Fitness now gets a chance to see who this product is, put a face to the name, see that we're really fun, lively, and fit in with the lifestyle of the trainers that they already work with. Um, so it's a good marriage of the two personalities and a chance to show who we are in a little bit of an unconventional way. All right, perfect. Uh, Mark, why don't you take it away? So how, does, how can small businesses benefit from integrating events into their business strategy? Yeah, so I mean, I love Emma's answer. I think it's, it's a really good opportunity to show off your personality and your brand. Um, but for me, events are incredibly flexible, so I think you can actually probably put on an event for almost any business goal that you want, um, and that's what I love about events. So if you're looking to generate leads um, and, and qualified sales leads, then you can put on a networking evening, you could uh, run a workshop perhaps, uh, you could do a breakfast panel um, with some of your key customers uh, in order to drive attendance. Um, if you're looking to launch a product or reposition your brand, then again, it's a great way to, to get creative and again, show off your personality, which uh, Emma talked about just now. Um, <clears throat> if you're looking to educate the market, if you've got a new product coming out, uh, maybe there's been a change in legislation, 
Uh, you want to position yourselves as thought leaders, and it's a great way to put together a panel um, to talk about those changes, to talk about your product, to educate your market. So, oh, I mean, for me, events are just such a natural, um, a natural marketing channel to um, to meet a lot of different business objectives. What have um, you seen small businesses in, say, retail have done with events? So, small businesses in retail. Um, what was your like favorite event that you've seen like a small business that? So there, there was a, a company uh, that was running an event through through the Eventbrite platform who have quite a technical product um, which basically helps other small businesses uh, move and adjust with different tax rates and uh, and there's a big change in VAT which maybe doesn't resonate globally but it's like a you know a tax of, that you have to pay on goods in here in the UK. Um, so they managed to, to put on an event which was uh, live cast and they reached out to HMRC which is our like our tax authority uh, and actually partnered with them to get this education out uh, about the, the key changes that are happening in the legislation and educate their audience and at the same time um, position themselves as thought leaders. Mm -hmm. So not a retail event but I thought it was a really good example of uh, of using events to to position yourselves as thought leaders and educate your market. Yeah, that's a great example. How about you, Melissa? What um, can small businesses benefit from integrating events in their business strategy? Um, everyone's covered a lot of it already, but one thing I think that events are really key for is helping you retain your customers, providing value back to the customers that you already had, and also providing them a channel to introduce their friends, their family, and their network to a brand that they like working with or a product that they use. Perfect. Now, I know you handle uh, FreshBooks social handles, so let's get on to question number two. How does social media play a part in throwing a successful event? So, Melissa, let's get you started here. Um, sure. So, I think social is a huge part of any event now. Uh, it allows you to communicate with people before the event, during the event, and after the event. Um, it also provides excellent content for you for all of your social handles. So, not only are other people sharing content for you, um, but it also gives you something fun and engaging that you can share out on your own handle. Um, and it's also a different way to show, not just tell how awesome your company is. So, you know, hosting a great event is a great way of being able to showcase how your brand interacts with the community um, instead of just writing a blog post about it. Perfect, yeah. How about you, Mark? What do you think about um, how, do, how does social media play a part in throwing successful events? Yeah, so uh, you know, Melissa's covered off uh, you know a lot of the important things there. Obviously, it's it's about social media can be used to drive, drive attendance and promote the event. It can be used to engage your audience when they're at the event. Um, I think one of the things that people maybe fall down on quite a lot is is actually getting on social media after the event. Um, and there's a there's a kind of idea of FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. Which you know is a, it's a great little acronym, acronym, and and we really see it. Um, at play here at Eventbrite, you know, if, if people do publicize their event after uh, it's happened or, or during so that people can see what they're missing out on and the great event that's taking place, it will really drive interest and attendance at future events. And I think maybe if some event organizers think a bit too short term purely about the, the one event that's taking place and they should be thinking about event their event strategy holistically and making sure that, that they're always thinking about their next audience. And I think social media is a great way of doing that. Do you see a lot of um, people who or organizations that use Eventbrite integrating social media right on their Eventbrite page, or have you seen a lot of people missing out on that opportunity? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's there as a functionality, and you know, of course, we've got a huge number of events, so a huge number do use it, but you'd be surprised how many don't. So I, I do think there's a large number of events that are missing out on that opportunity. Perfect. Um, Emma, how about you? How does social media play a part in your guys' events? Just a little plug for Mark. We use Eventbrite all the time. Super <laughs> helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> totally. I was going to say, kind of building off of Melissa, too, it sets the tone. So when you think about, you know, typically we might have just put up a web page to um, advertise the event. With social media, you have so many more opportunities to, whether it's little quotes or share imagery through your Instagram, so you give more teasers to people uh, in the lead up. And similarly to what Mark said too, don't think about your social media as just that one event. There'll be so many people that catch you know, a tweet or a post and it puts it on their radar for the next time. So it's almost like you're doing PR 
as a whole strategy throughout the year, even if you're building up towards one event. So think about the lingering impression. Um, the other piece too is it keeps the event on people's radar. So I find with a lot of the workshops that I do, the registrations accelerate in the last couple of days, no matter how tuned in the audience was, no matter how targeted the um, outreach was, the RSVPs will climb in the last couple of days. So it's just a good way of giving those reminders without having to blast people's inboxes all the time and say, sign up, RSVP. <laughs> Good little reminder for folks. Exactly. Um, what kind of follow up do you guys do on social after your uh, workshops that you guys host? A lot, actually, especially because they're more nutrition based and educational. A lot of people will interact through Q and A. We'll do live tweeting during events as well. So a lot of that is following up on Q and A as if it was an audience member that was live attending the event. Um, the other piece too is just the feel good vibe. So I think everyone's kind of mentioned that is. Um, those are residual impressions that you want to not leave lingering online. It's kind of like you walked away from a conversation <laughs> without ending it. So think about it that, that way. It's, it's someone real in front of you. You've got to finish the conversation. Yeah, so this ties in uh, perfectly to our next question. How do you use social media before, during, and after event? I know you kind of touched on it, but um, do you know exactly, like, how do you guys do it, like, right before, right during, and right after? Totally. We do lots of different things, actually. So when we're affiliated with other partners for events, and I highly recommend that approach, don't feel like you have to go it alone. Um, we'll do a lot of different announcement posts to announce the event and then tagging affiliated partners. Um, so a quick example would be through the Eat to Run workshops that I do. We partner with a local um, charitable organization called Soul Girls. And Soul Girls is really active on social media, so they're great at helping to spread the word about these Eat to Run workshops also because they're benefiting from a part of the proceeds. Um, but it's a good announcement way, it's a good way of feeding out um, the event to different channels. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we do is teaser uh, posts. So this is something we've done, for an example, with the Seawees, uh, Lululemon Half Marathon Vega was partnered as the nutrition um, partners. So what we did with Lululemon was a number of different blog posts in the lead up to the race about both the nutrition that they could expect on course, but also some tips for during training as well. So those teaser posts ended up building interest, helping to create momentum on the day, encourage people to come and check out the Vega booth and do some sampling. Um, so it really built in that buzz to make sure that the event was well attended and successful at the end. All right, that's great. Um, Emma, how about you? How do you guys use social media before, during, and after an event? Do you mean, sorry, Melissa, maybe? Oh, <laughs> Melissa, sorry, Melissa, sorry. It's okay. Um, so we use it for really similar purposes, one for promoting and sending out teasers, simple reminders as well, so we don't have to flood people's inbox. Um, it, it's also a way, sending out these promo tweets, is that if we have people who we might not have their emails, but they think they would be a good fit for the event, mm -hmm. then um, it's a way for us expanding our reach and also um, allowing people to RSVP that might not have been interacting with us before. Um, we also use it uh, during our event to communicate with people right then and on the spot to make sure everyone's having a good time. Um, usually when I host events, there's, you know, maybe four or five people from the company there and, you know, a hundred or so guests and it's really hard to interact with everybody. So to make sure that everyone's having a good time, um, it's definitely easy to be able to converse through Twitter because everyone's on their phone the entire time. Um, Going back to something that Mark had said earlier, uh, we use social during events to kind of create a sense of FOMO. Um, so that way people will want to follow up with us to see how they can get on the guest list for the next event. Um, or if the event is just kicking off, then we can send out an open invitation for those people who said that they wish they could come. Uh, say, hey, come join us. Like, Make sure you look out for us, um, and we'll just get you into the event. And then after the event, um, just following up with people that we had really great conversations with. Um, we do a lot of surprise and delight, so being able to follow up after, um, you know, maybe be able to get people's contact information, so that way we can send them a little something as well. How many people do you have managing um, your guys' Twitter handles during, during the event, if there's so many people tweeting at you guys? Uh, usually it's just myself and another colleague will have access to it. Mm -hmm. um, we encourage everybody who is there on behalf of the company to message out through their own personal handles, just to be able to say, um, you know, we're here too from FreshBooks or from whatever company we're, I'm working for that day, and then um, we get everybody to just, you know, be very personable about it. Perfect. How about you, Mark? How do you use social media to play uh, during, 
before, during, and after an event? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of good good stuff that's already been covered. Um, so I'll try and try and um, cover some slightly different ground. Um, so we haven't talked, to, as far as I'm aware, about hashtags and kind of the importance of hashtags as a as a central calling ground or a central place to rally the whole conversation around during the event. So I definitely recommend that that during the whole process of naming your event and coming up with the concept that you try and think of a hashtag early on. Um, you know, something that's that's short, that's memorable, um, that 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 makes some sense to people. Uh, and then make sure that, that that hashtag is kind of everywhere. You know, it's on your event page, it's distributed to your speakers, to your attendees, and really that that becomes the central calling card for the for the social conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe not everyone forgets this, but, um, you know, hashtags obviously work across more than just Twitter as well, so you can hashtag uh, across Facebook, across Pinterest. In fact, really, LinkedIn's the only major uh, network that doesn't embrace, ha embrace hashtags. So... I think hashtags are a great, great thing that can run throughout the event. Um, I think other things to consider in terms of um, before the event is uh, is um, Emma talked about using partners. So we that's pretty much one of our most successful routes um, to to kind of good engaged events. We make sure we uh, we tweet out and tag partners whenever we're doing um, promotion for our events, and and that that works to great effect. Um, another tip, which is I, I hope this fits into um, you know this kind of question, but with Eventbrite, if you are using Eventbrite to register people for your event, you can. There's an option to uh, have custom questions where you can ask people for specific details. And I think uh, again, not enough people maybe use that feature to capture their attendees' Twitter handles, uh, maybe their Facebook pages, so that they know how to engage with them directly after an event as well. So that's that's another little tip that that hopefully people can use. Um, and then we've talked quite a lot about on-site and using uh, and using social media during the event to engage attendees and answer questions. Um, so maybe two other things post-event. Um, one is that to make sure that you're tagging attendees uh, in photos. Uh, you know, Twitter rolled that out rolled out that feature um, earlier last year. That's really effective. People love to see them, seeing themselves in photos, and it's a great way to get engagement. Uh, and build that FOMO after an event's finished or even during the event. Uh, and then the other thing that uh, I find is effective, if you're running a, an educational event and you've got speakers and they're using slides, make sure you get your slides uploaded to SlideShare and you know you can embed those directly into, into tweets now so people can actually flip through and see, see the slides in their Twitter stream, which is, which is a great way, again, of getting your message across after an event. Definitely. Now, speaking of hashtags, uh, for those of you watching, uh, make sure to use the hashtag social60. So that's full spelt out social60, not just 60, 60, 6-I-X, I mean S-I-X-T-Y. Um, and you guys can tweet in your questions. We will have a Q&A at the very end. And you can also include your questions um, in the Google Plus page where this video is hosted. Now, back to our question here, question number three. Um, a little bit of a plug in here. Um, how do you guys manage um, your event social media with Hootsuite? So, um, Melissa, let's get you answering this one first. Um, I think the best thing is the push notifications. Um, so if you're making sure those are turned on, you can see anyone who's mentioning you. So it makes it really easy getting um, responding to people at events because you don't need to search for it. Um, you know, we do live tweeting at all our events, so another key thing is making sure that we set up a search stream for our event hashtag, um, and then also for our, we always have it anyway, but for um, our company name as well, so that way we can easily mention on there. Um, another good list to create is if you know everyone who's attending social handles, being able to create a list um, right on Hootsuite, so that way you'll be able to see what they're talking about. Um, so that way, if people are complaining that they're running late or anything along those lines, you're able to see it and then easily respond. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it that we use it for. Um, also, using it to monitor comments and stuff when at the end of the event we put up a Facebook album or anything along those lines, we're able to monitor and then use the analytics and stuff on the back end um, to be able to see how much of a success the event was. Perfect. Emma, how do you guys use Hootsuite for your guys' events? Um, similar to the teaser tweets that I mentioned before, so if we've got little kind of snippets of content, especially because we're a very educational brand, we really want to feed those teaser tweets out. 
but there might be multiple people working on an event. So we want to make sure that, you know, I might see what someone else has scheduled or um, someone else could see that I've actually logged, you know, maybe a week's worth of scheduled tweets um, to build that interest towards an event. So you're not constantly every day having to think of something new. You can set aside maybe one hour each week to set up all of your scheduled tweets for those kind of teaser tidbits to get people interested in your event. And then you can, of course, compress your hashtag right there in Hootsuite too. So it's just kind of your all-in-one place dashboard, mm -hmm. um, which I really appreciate. And then the ability to have multiple people sign into that same account so you can see what other people are working on rather than have to switch between a bunch of different spreadsheets and documents and conference calls. It's all in one place. How about you guys? How about you, Mark? Um, how do you guys use Hootsuite to run your events? <clears throat> um, so again, lots of great, great points covered there. Melissa, I love your idea of um, adding all your participants to a list. I've never thought to do that. I think that's absolutely brilliant. So I'm, I'm definitely going to try that out at the next event. Um, but in terms of the way we use it, so again, I, I mean, I love the, the ability to have all your streams in one place, in one dashboard, so you can make sure you're monitoring for the event hashtag, as well as company mentions, as well as any, you know, if you're trying to track any key influencers, if you've got a keynote speaker and you want to see how people are responding to them, it's very easy to, to see how engaged people are with their talk, what their key takeaways are. So, I mean, the dashboard functionality is absolutely invaluable. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, Emma touched on this, but scheduling tweets um, is great for promotion, but it's really great for drawing the event as well. Um, if you're running a one or two day conference, let's say, you've got multiple tracks, you know what time things are meant to be happening, you don't want to be having to think about writing that on the day, you've got lots of other things to consider, so make sure you've got reminders about when the next session starts, five minutes ahead of time, when when is lunch, where is it, so you can actually preempt and, and answer a lot of the key questions that your delegates are going to have um, by, by pre-scheduling them through Hootsuite, which is great. Uh, and then, um, I forget, I think, uh, Melissa, it was yourself who touched on the analytics. Um, you know, again, it's a really intuitive kind of dashboard there. So it's great to go back after the event and take a look and, and just see how engaged people were. You know, how many mentions did you get? How many new Twitter followers did you did you manage to build? Uh, what was your reach on Facebook for, you know, for your particular events hashtag? Um, all that's dead easy to, to, to pull out through the, the Hootsuite dashboard, so yeah. I want to um, just build off of Mark there because I think that's such a huge point about social media is it gives you metrics after an event. So looking at you know how many people retweeted or how many impressions were made, I feel like that ROI value of social media gets undervalued a lot. I think that's a really valid point. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and you can, you know, from a content marketing perspective, if you can see there's a particular topic or a particular speaker that's really resonated with people, yeah. and that's a brilliant, you know, that's a brilliant tangible uh, metric that you can use, and you can write more on that. You can create more blog posts around that, and you know that that's real evidence-based stuff that that will help you with your future marketing. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, speaking of measuring the success of your event through analytics, how do you how do you guys uh, measure the success of an event, um, either through social media or through like surveys and stuff? How do you guys do it? Surveys, for sure. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to say surveys is one way that we do. You can send out um, a digital link, but uh, both qualitative and quantitatively. Qualitatively, we will look at kind of the tone and the vibe of people's comments or posts, especially on Instagram. Just seeing, you know, if you collect a bunch of people's posts and then you're putting that together in a, a recap for, you know, whether it be senior management or you're sharing it amongst your team, it gives you kind of that impression in a nutshell of what the what people felt at your event. Um, so think about it qualitatively and quantitatively, because you can, of course, measure how many times something was retweeted or what have you, but um, look for those feel-good human elements as well, so how people describe the event. Do you guys have, like, a, like a measure of, like, what, like, unknowing, like, this, this tweet is a feel-good tweet or, like, this is... Not totally, I know it's hard, but you'll know as your brand if something, if someone maybe, for example, um, uses a slogan that you try to kind of put into the event somewhere. So an example would be we had a spin event partnered with uh, a local spin studio here in Vancouver with Vega, and the theme was happy hour spin. So if people were talking about it as if it was a healthy happy hour, and they were looking at it like the best way to spend your Friday night at the best club on Granville Street, um, though it was a sweaty <laughs> club in a uh, physical sense, like working out versus you know sweating it out on a Friday night on the dance floor, um, if people were kind of sharing the right vibe that you hoped to get, you know you made the right impression. So that's kind of how we would gauge it. Was it on the strategy that we you know, meant to showcase? 
So that's a good one. Uh, Melissa, how do you guys measure the success of an event? So impressions, um, reach, that's always very important. But something that is equally important for us is definitely seeing the stories that come out of it um, and seeing what people learn from each other or who people connected with. Um, those are really key takeaways and nuggets. Um, before my time, uh, before I joined FreshBooks, uh, we, we host customer meetups on a regular basis, and we actually had um, two customers meet at a customer meetup, fall in love, and get married. So that was like a cool <laughs> story to be able to share. So um, not sure what the impressions in the reach were um, <laughs> from that particular event, but the fact that we have that cool story that we can share is something that's really key. Um, we had a customer meetup during Small Business Week in Toronto, um, and we connected um, a writer with a small business owner, and then they're being featured in um, a Toronto magazine later this year because they had such a cool business. So those are stories um, that I think are all, or stories are really important as well, not just the numbers at the end of the day that you can share with people. That's a great point. Um, Mark, how do you guys measure the success of an event? So <clears throat> from a personal point of view, when, when I'm running events, one of the key key things that we're looking to do is introduce Eventbrite, obviously, to, to new people um, that may not be aware that there's ticketing or registration software out there in the first place. And if they are, you know, kind of get them to think about why they might want to use us. Um, but actually, you know, I try not to take an overly promotional approach to events. So, so the main thing that I, I run events for is to evangelize why events are good, right? Why they can help businesses, why they can form a part of any business's marketing strategy, uh, and then how to, to successfully run events. So, so it's kind of a two-tiered approach. Um, we want to take, take that evangelizing message out to the world, but then, of course, at the end of it, it's great if people actually sign up and use our platform to then go, go and create their event. So I certainly look at, at reach, you know, how many people signed up for the event, how many people have attended, um, how many people have, have heard about Eventbrite after the event because of engagement through social media. Um, then going down the funnel, how many people have signed up for a new account after the event, um, and how many people have then gone on to, to run an event through the platform. I mean, that, that's kind of ultimately the success metric that, that I want to look at. Um, and then the other thing that, that I, you know, I would like to see and get out of events uh, as much as possible is great content to write about. I mean, you know, because I've got those, those twin responsibilities, content marketing, social media manager, as well as running events. Um, so it's great. It's great to, to, to have interesting things to write about and, and good content. So, you know, if I, I finish an event and I've got lots of things to write about after, then that's a success as well. Perfect, um, Melissa. Yeah. What do you guys see as like the which ne social networks do attendees engage, engage on the most? Um, I think the easiest things that people are on are primarily Twitter and now on Instagram. Um, just because the barrier to get to see people is pretty much not there unless you have a private profile. Mm -hmm. um, so it's easy to share and, engage, um, and interact with people on it. So that's where we're seeing people first. And then um, post-event, we're seeing a lot of people move to LinkedIn as well. Oh, yeah. So um, you see lots of connections and stuff happening after having met in person and maybe having a drink or a cup of coffee or something with those people. Mm -hmm. Emma, how about you? Like When it comes to your guys' workshop, which social networks do you see attendees engage on the most? Interesting, it used to be Twitter a couple of years ago, and now it's definitely Instagram. And part of that, too, is at Vega, we've got a regionalized strategy. So there'll be each kind of regional hub has its own Instagram feed, also the Vega corporate. So the fact that we've got each of those kind of pods um, facilitating interactions on a more intimate level within each region just makes that a much more successful platform for us. So I'd say Instagram, for sure, now is our most kind of coveted and popular yeah. How about how about you, Mark? Um, over there in the UK, what social networks um, do you see people using the most when it comes to engaging to with events? Yeah, it's interesting. <clears throat> I mean, I don't have the metadata to back this up, but I would say Instagram still isn't as popular here. Um, it's still not quite quite the same phenomenon in the UK as it maybe is in the US and Canada. Um, but obviously, it's increasing in popularity. So I think it's a really important channel, and, and definitely we see attendees. Uh, using Instagram to, to engage and share their event experience. Um, I would say because events are, are this kind of real-time live stream, then Twitter is still best suited for, for during the event, and we probably see the most interaction there. Um, again, Melissa, great point. Like You definitely see people moving on to LinkedIn after an event. Um, 
and, and again, it depends what kind of event. You know, it's always going to differ on context. So if it's more of a consumer event and people want to share their experiences, they're more likely to do it on Instagram and Facebook. And and if it's a business event and they're looking to, to build you know build their social their, their professional network, then LinkedIn's the obvious choice. Um, I pro probably should throw out that we um, we track um, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook in terms of their importance to events. In driving attendance prior to an event and we still see uh, across our entire networks there's obviously going to be big variations uh, in different types of events but but at an absolute meta level we still see that Twitter is the most important social network for driving incremental revenue to events uh, followed by Facebook and then LinkedIn um, it, it, there's going to be massive variations in that but across our entire network that that's what we see Perfect. Um, now, before I get into my my last question here, I, I do want to remind our audience that they can also tweet in their questions using the hashtag social60, um, and also placing their questions right on the Google Plus um, event page here. Now, my last question for our panelists for today is, what are your three top tips for small businesses throwing their very first event? So, Melissa, let's let's hear your three top tips here. Um, so my top tip is making sure to, if you want your event to be a social friendly event, make sure that you share a shareable moment. Um, so something that's really cool and awesome, at our Toronto customer meetup we got a donut wall created from um, donuts to make our logo. That's a little bit over the top, but something that is shareable, whether it's a contest or, you know, cool image or something along those lines. Um, making sure you have a really awesome hashtag and having it somewhere around for people to be able to see it. So whether you have a PowerPoint app that every slide has um, the hashtag on it, or if you're you know, at a restaurant or a bar, uh, putting little table cards out so that way the hashtag is around for people to be able to see. And then also making sure that your guests um, know the reason why they're there. So are you launching a new product and they're the first ones to know? Are you hoping that you can connect them with other small business owners so you're giving them the opportunity to network? Or are you providing education? So uh, is there a speaker that's there um, that's going to talk to them? So just making sure at the end of the day that your guests know the reason why they should come and why they, what they're hoping to get out of it. Perfect. Um, Emma, how about you? What are your top three tips for small businesses throwing their first event? Man, how to be succinct on this one, hey? <laughs> um, Probably my uh, number one tip is to set the tone. So define how you want the participants to feel. And do this early on before you get too far into planning and you have to kind of backtrack maybe on giving someone lead, uh, leeway to do some of the social media in advance and they weren't quite clear on what the vibe was and then they miscommunicate maybe the impression you tried to give. So be really, really clear on how you want your participants to feel. Um, so an example, the um, spinning event that we did just recently we wanted it to be fun and inspiring and motivating, so all of the organizers that were working on it got together at first to talk about that tone before we all kind of went off and each did our individual planning. Um, so set the tone. The second one is to piggyback onto other built-in audiences versus starting to market your event from scratch. So what I mean by that is tapping into other influencers who might have a network that you think would be really um, connected to your event so they can help spread the word for you or partnering with a brand who perhaps has an email database of potential attendees and that partner brand can then do some inviting on your behalf so don't feel like you have to do all the marketing yourself partner with other people who can help generate the audience um, and then my last tip of course nutritionist in me has to say take care of yourself <laughs> so kind of like what Mark was saying if you're frazzled on the day trying to send tweets about where lunch is it's just a waste of your time so you know clear your schedule a couple of days in advance so you can do those last couple of loose end tying ups make sure you eat well before the event so your blood sugar is balanced you're not crazy psycho diva on the day you want to be the most level-headed person in the room and similarly to my first tip you're setting the tone so how you arrive on the day is going to leave an impression on everyone. So don't underestimate taking care of yourself and the importance of how that affects your event delivery. That is such a great tip because I know whenever I host an event, I always forget to eat and then I'm like, why am I so crazy today? Or not thinking, right? You might make rash decisions if you're not taking care of yourself. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, Mark, how about you? What are your uh, top three tips for small businesses throwing their first events? Um, so, first tip, um, beyond listening to Emma and Melissa and taking on board their six tips, <laughs> uh, I would say the first thing, so the first thing is, is just figure out what the purpose of the event is. You know, why are you running it? What is the goal? Um, so I try and take people, when, when I've talked to other small businesses, we've, we've developed this um, event plan, and it's just, just a really simple one sheet, um, which I believe you guys are going to be able to tweet out the link to, uh, so people can, can fill it out. Uh, it's based on Alex Osterwalder's business model canvas, so it's kind of a well-tested methodology, but it just helps people think through their event uh, and, and um, put it on for the right reasons and match the type of event with the, the reason, the business reason for running it. So I think have a purpose uh, and know what that purpose is and then match the kind of event to it. So that's, that's tip number one. Uh, I think tip number two is probably to, to make sure you capture the event in all its glory and in as many ways as you can. So I, I do think people spend an inordinate amount of time planning the event and, and then on site, <clears throat> kind of like Emma said, they get crazy and you get caught up in the moment and and you actually forget to capture all the great moments that are taking place. Um, so, so I think you've got to, to really have a plan in place ahead of the event to, to know how you're going to, to capture what's taking place and, and build that event experience. And then the third thing is take the time after the event to share the experience and share that, share that content with your audience, through, again, through social media, um, through your partners, um, through the hashtag any way that you can really, builds, builds that FOMO, builds that momentum, uh, and hopefully it helps you then um, uh, put on more successful events after. So basically plan, so to recap, plan and have an event, for per, um, put on events with a purpose, make sure you capture the essence of the event and, what's, and why it's been so great, and then share that with your audience after. Perfect. So I'm going to go in here and see what kind of questions we have here on social. Um, the first one I see here, we, you guys talked about it a lot um, today. Um, a, a tweet that came in is, how far in advance do you send out teaser posts before an event? So um, Emma, I know you spoke on that a lot. So how, do, how far in advance do you guys send out your teaser posts? Mm, interesting. So you can actually start them even before you announce the event. You might not be linking to a website that people are RSVPing right away but you can definitely start building the buzz. So as an example, let's use the CWEEZ example, you could start feeding out tips about half marathon nutrition in the lead up to this race, but then announce whether it's registration opens or whether there's you know, a set time that you're meeting with different participants, maybe to do a recipe sampling. You can announce the specifics later, but build the audience first. So you can start teaser tweets at any time. Um, it's all related to your topic, it's all related to building your brand and then you can layer in the date information later, but typically about six weeks out tends to be when we announce the actual RSVP registration is open, um, just so you're not leaving it for months and months. All right. Melissa, how about you? How, um, how far in advance do you guys send out your teaser tweets or social posts? Sometimes I actually reach out to our network to figure out the kind of event and stuff that they want, which acts as a teaser in its own. So if we're looking for a venue, we're looking for recommendations for speakers, that's a possibility. Um, if it's a free event, usually a week to two weeks in advance and just ramping it up um, closer to the day. If it's a paid event that you have to attend to, um, as soon as, you know, the day that you put registration live is usually when I would start doing those, those tweets to try to get the numbers up and those tickets sold. Perfect. Mark, how about you? So, so the answer is always kind of depends. It depends on the event and, and the size of the event. Um, but so to give a couple of concrete examples, um, Content Marketing Institute run an event called Content Marketing World, which is which is big. It's a big event in the US, um, and they they basically never stop, right? It's a it's an annual thing, and they run that marketing throughout uh, throughout the year. So they have uh, weekly Twitter chats using the event hashtag, so it keeps people engaged. Um, and I I I think that's a really smart strategy, and I I think it's something that large event organizers are all really trying to do so that you stop having this peak and trough cycle. Um, actually, you, you are building an event community throughout the year, and so you never actually stop. And I think, I think that's a really smart strategy. Mm -hmm. I think if that's not your, your bread and butter, it's not where all of your revenue is coming from and you don't have the time to do that, then, then obviously it's going to massively depend 
Uh, I love, I, you know, I think Melissa's idea of, of maybe not ramping up the teaser um, activity until your event's live makes makes sense because you know you've got nowhere to direct people to, um, so that you don't want to expend too much effort prior to, to having an event page live. Um, and I think one of the comment is not to despair if you've not got loads of signups until pretty close to the event. Um, a typical event cycle, no matter how far out that you you actually make the event live <clears throat> and start promoting it, is you get a peak of interest. And then this kind of trough of despair, where it's really hard and you wouldn't worry if it's ever going to pick up momentum. And then, like again, depending on the event, but a week out, sometimes even two days out, you get this final ramp up of, mm -hmm. uh, of people signing up for the event. So you know, try not to despair too much and uh, and just keep pushing on the marketing if if you're not seeing the momentum. Uh, I just want to build off of what Mark just said because I totally agree with that that you'll wait until sometimes even the 24 hours before and then all of a sudden the event is sold out. So set up with the team that's organizing kind of a drop dead date that, you know, this is our last chance if we don't have enough numbers to make it viable, you know, for the amount of effort we're putting into it. So agree on that drop dead date, but leave it, it can be quite close. So leave it maybe even 24 hours to 48 hours before because I totally agree, get that rush, dip, and then it accelerates again at the end, bang on. Yeah. Absolutely. And actually, can I just add another comment, which is <clears throat> there's a big, big difference, again, bet between free and paid events. So so free events, you know, people will happily sign up, and then they'll just completely forget about it, and they basically won't turn up. So, you you know, you can have a typical dropout rate of 50% or more. So, so on the one hand, with a paid event, you might worry that you've not got enough people signed up, but actually, very close to the event, when people know that they're free, they'll sign up, pay, and they'll actually turn up which is great, whereas free events you kind of have the opposite, which is people will just sign up, forget, and then on the day people won't turn up, and that's a real shame. It means you can over-cater, it means you can have an empty space. So um, it's obviously entirely up to you whether you want to run free or paid events, but you've got to be aware of those differing, um, differing factors. That's a great point. Now we have another question here. Um, how would you change your strategy for an event of 20 people or 2,000 people? Who wants to take a stab at that first? <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably hire more people for an event with 2,000. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't think you need to fundamentally change your strategy. I think all of these tips that we've talked about are, are really good ones for any size of event, right? You know, understand your attendees, know the purpose of your, of your event, give people memorable experiences, engage with your audience. Like, it doesn't matter what size of an event, whether it's two people or 2,000, they're all great tips. I think the fundamentals of a, of a good event stay the same. It's the details, it's the tactical execution that's going to change, and, and fundamentally you're just going to need <clears throat> more people. Yeah. Uh, and a, you, know, you need to be a savvy event planner to run an event for 2,000 people. You need to make experience, you need to be set up for that number of, of attendees, um, otherwise things can go wrong. So. I, I would suggest if you've never run an event before and you're expecting 2,000 people, kind of work with a professional who's done that um, because because that that's, that is a significant step change up from 20. Yeah. Melissa, do you have something to add? Yeah, I would just also add that when you are switching from a smaller event, so of like the 20-ish people and going into the hundreds or thousands, to rely more on your partners, so your, vis your um, venue partner, your caterers, um, your speakers, because you can't tackle it all on your own. Um, even if you do hire more people to work with you, uh, you really need to depend on those external partners on that. Um, and also adjust your time frames a lot. It's going to take a little bit more than a couple days to put together something um, for 2,000 people than it is for, for the 20. So those are the biggest things that are changing. Your dependency, and then I would also say um, your time frames need to adjust. Perfect. Emma, do you have something to add to that? Sure, yeah, I think um, kind of similar to what Melissa mentioned actually in a previous question about um, you know maybe there's a hashtag you want to share for your event. It's going to be far more diluted if you're only putting it on let's say a business card with 2,000 people versus 20. So with 2,000 people you really have to magnify if there's a call to action or a website you want them to visit or anywhere you're trying to drive them to. Um, it's got to be everywhere, you know, multiple points of interruption and they've got to see it throughout the entire event so don't assume that you know, one display or one banner or one card is going to do the trick when there's that many people. Your ideas are going to be far more diluted, so magnify them. Perfect. So this this um, question here, 
kind of tacks on to what you guys were talking about free or paid events. Um, how would you determine whether or not you should be charging for an event um, as well as the price? Mm. I can jump in on this one first. We go through this a lot actually just with different retailers that we partner with and it's uh, it depends on the topic often and also if we're partnering with a charitable group. So we might layer in a fee, for example, to attend an education workshop if we're going to be contributing a part of that um, entrance fee towards a charitable cause. So it gives that feel-good factor in there as well. Um, I think Mark kind of touched on this before too in terms of how committed an RSVP is. When you do have a paid to attend incentive, um, I definitely find that secures RSVPs earlier on versus when it's a free attempt that really is kind of those last minute signups. So it just depends on how much, I guess, assurance you want that you're going to get the ROI for the time you're putting into the event. Having it be a paid attendance might give you that assurance early on that you're going to be able to meet your budget, that you're going to get the signups that you need. So um, I think paid events affect your promotional window. Um, when I was mentioning earlier that six weeks out, typically that's going to be for a paid event. If it's free, you might only be doing teaser tweets three weeks out. Um, so it'll affect, yeah, it'll affect your promotional strategy as well. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have something to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just to, just to build on what, what I spoke about earlier, <clears throat> it, it's definitely going to depend on, on whether, like Emma said, it's going to depend on, on to an extent, your, your risk. Um, you know, if you're going to do a free event and you're hoping to get 500 people um, and you, you get an event, uh, you maybe hire a venue space and you, you put money into the catering for 500 people, it's a free event and you get 500 people registered, you're probably going to expect only 50% of those to turn up. So if you want to, to minimize the risk, then you probably want to do a paid event so that you get the commitment and then, then there's much, much less likely uh, that that those attendees are going to drop out, and also you're helping to cover your costs as well, right? Um, you know, events aren't free, so you know it's always nice to have a little bit of revenue to cover cover your costs. Um, I mean, other considerations are price. You know, this is just generally in the world. You know, across the world of of commerce, price affects a perception of value. So something that's more expensive is generally perceived as more valuable. Doesn't it, it doesn't hold always, but generally that's true. So if you, uh, yeah, if you want to, to um, if you want to put your knowledge at a certain price point as you know as not cheap, <laughs> you know, charge for a bit more, and people will probably perceive it as a bit more valuable. Um, yeah, I, th I think they're they're some of the considerations. Perfect, Melissa. Do you have something to add to that question? Um, when you have a free event, people really just aren't a hundred percent committed it's snowing out or it's like a torrential downpour, people are more likely to say no, that they won't attend um, versus if they paid even a small amount like $10. So if you are planning on hosting a free event and you don't want drop off, the best thing I would suggest is partnering with a community group or a charity that shares the same val values as you and your brand um, and donate 100% of the proceeds. If you have the budget for it, um, donate 100% of the proceeds to the charity that you're working with. They'll usually have somebody on site. They'll help you, you know, share out about your event. Um, but it's also this added value for attendees because they they feel good doing it, um, and they're because they paid to attend that they'll actually show up. Great point. Um, All right, to, yes. oh. to, sorry, I just wanted to. I just thought one one of the thing that I think is worth mentioning, which is <clears throat> going back to that idea of perceived value. If people are paying quite a lot of money to attend your event, their expectations will be a lot higher than a free event. So they're going to expect some of that budget to go back into the event experience. You know, they're, they're not going to put up with, you know, if you attend a free event, there's a certain expectation that maybe it's not too professional. It, you know, people let things slide um, very easily because they've not paid for it. Whereas if, if you've paid $100, you know, $500, um, you're going to expect a certain level of service and experience at that event. So if you're not prepared to invest that and give that back, then you may want to consider the free option. Yeah. Sorry, just jumping in on that comment as well. Um, you also have to realize when you're pricing it out, the kind of budget that you want your ideal attendees to be able to attend. If it's something that's more targeted at a younger audience, maybe students, they have a tighter budget, they won't be able to afford you know, a 50 or $60 ticket, and they are wanting something that's a little bit more affordable for them. Um, whereas if your ideal situation might be like 
business people and their companies are the ones that are paying for it, then um, you might be able to charge a little bit more for the event, so in the $100 plus range. Great point. All right, so I have one last question here. Um, if someone is unhappy at your event and sharing it on social, how would you guys recommend dealing with that? Melissa, why don't you take a stab at that first? <laughs> Um, well, the first thing I would do is actually make sure that they're at the event. Uh, <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> uh, who, you know, they're really upset because they might not live in the city that the event is, so they're just trolling you. Uh, so first, make sure that they're at the event. And then, um, secondly, try to take the conversation offline. So ask them to, um, you know, sorry that, I, that you're not having the greatest time. How about you meet me at the bar and we can see what we can do to make this right. Um, so if you can help make the situation correct offline and then, um, you know, send up a follow-up message being like, glad that that's all resolved. Um, let us know how you enjoy the rest of the night so that way people online know that it has been rectified and it just hasn't been ignored. Um, I find people who are not having the best time at events are kind of a little bit toxic. So the sooner that you can rectify and try to make the night correct um, and fun for everybody, uh, the better everybody will be. So Perfect. Emma, did you have something to add to that question? Yeah, I think just respond immediately online. It depends what platform they're reporting their experience on, too. If it's on Twitter, you're not going to have a lot of time to overcome objections with 140 characters. So acknowledging at least that you've seen their message and providing a direct link to email that you can follow up with them so that if anyone else sees the tweet, they see that you immediately replied and you've taken it offline so that you can give them a more personal experience. I'd hate to try and resolve you know, an issue with 140 characters when that's not really going to give them the most human impression about you as well. So I think take it offline, but acknowledge online. That's a great point. Acknowledging that you know that they're frustrated is a really important part and uh, making sure that your social media presence online for your brand is good as well. Uh, Mark, you have something to add in regards to dealing with anybody being angry or mad about your event on social? Um, not really, not in addition to, to what Emma and Melissa have spoken about. I think they're absolutely spot on. You can't ignore it. You absolutely have to acknowledge it very quickly, but don't try and engage them directly and solve the problem in that public eye. You know, just, just diffuse it, tell them you've acknowledged their, their issue and that you're going to, to look to solve it and then try and take it offline, as, as they've already said. I, I mean, that's that's really the only way you can deal with these situations. All right. Oh, actually, I have one more question here. Um, so since events are live, um, how can businesses use social media to deal with unexpected event, um, like issues at the event? Do you guys have any examples? That's um, a good question. <laughs> So, I mean, there's some things at events that are totally out of your control. Um, for example, weather. Um, so the best thing to do, um, or, you know, transit delays or something along those lines, is keep the lines open and provide as much helpful feedback to attendees as possible. Um, you know, uh, we have a lot of events that we host in Toronto, and sometimes um, we're able to get, like, Uber discounts or... Um, you know, Beck Taxi or other companies might be able to provide a discount or something. So you can also reach out and just be like, hey, it's raining, wondering, if, you know, we're having an event here, wondering if you guys might be able to send some cabs over and then just creating an, an easy environment for attendees um, and keeping that online and letting people know that, hey, you know, it's raining outside, don't worry, we've got cabs outside waiting for you or the bus is delayed, just keeping those open conversations. So. Great. Yeah. I, I think, um, just, just to add to that, it's really going to depend again on your company and your brand and how you would normally respond to social media. It's probably not going to differ too much um, <clears throat> whether there's something unexpected happened uh, at an event or whether it's just, just come into your Twitter stream anyway. So you know, if you've got a, a humorous, quirky brand, you can probably get away with being a little bit cheekier and you've got some more leniency there. Um, which is the beauty of having quirky brands. Uh, if you're not, and it's a, a much more corporate and straight list kind of uh, company that you're working for, then you know don't don't try and differ too much from your tone of voice. I, you've got to deal with it in the same way that you would deal with other other things coming into your Twitter stream uh, or, or other social channels. Um, so I'd, ju I'd just say kind of respond authentically with your typical you know business voice. 
um, and don't try and differ too much just be, just because it's been an unexpected event. Yeah. Emma, do you have something to add to that question? Yeah, I'm just going to feed in two little quick tips. Whether it's a paid event or not, getting RSVPs in advance will allow you to do a quick blast out if there is you know something unexpected like weather cancels the event actually because people can't even get to where you're hosting it. So even if you're not asking for paid to attend um, style of workshop, using something like Eventbrite gets your RSVPs on there. So then at least you can e-blast people directly because you might not always reach them with social media if it is something that's unexpected and going to affect the experience. Yeah. Um, the other quick tip too is just to pin, if you've got a, an update that's related to something unexpected that most attendees need to know, is on your Twitter page, pin that relevant tweet versus letting it kind of filter down as you discuss with other people, other conversations, get that, that tweet kind of front and center and stay it there until that event mm -hmm. is over. That's that's a great tip, and you, and of course you can do that on on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. You can make sure you keep keep that relevant status pinned to the top. That's that's a really good tip. Yeah, great tip. All right, so that wraps up our Social 60 um, online panel for this month. So first of all, thank you so much to our amazing panelists here. Um, thank you to everyone who is viewing. Um, if you guys have any more questions, please make sure to keep tweeting using the hashtag Social60. Make sure you follow us at Hootsuite Pro and at Hoot Community, and as well as on Google Plus to stay up to date with any of our upcoming Social 60 events which we host um, every month. So thank you guys again, and thank you again to our our panelists. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.